Hello, everyone. We've reached over 1,000 subscribers. That was very fast, actually. Um, I'm quite surprised. So thank you. And let's continue growing this little channel and community. Uh, I see a lot of comments from regular members. So it's nice to see a lot of familiar faces. Um, and I enjoy answering all your questions. Uh, if you know anyone who's interested in astral projection, out-of-body experiences, or they're just trying to make sense of it all, please share the channel with them so that they can hopefully find some insight into it. All right, so I wanted to do an episode on the importance of personal and spiritual energy and the cultivation and conservation of it and how saving our energy can be sort of like saving money in the bank and when we have enough of it saved we can spend it on endeavors such as astral projection. Of course I'm talking very vaguely here about energy. I will try to be more specific but how you understand it will ultimately be up to you and your own intuition because clearly there is no absolute definition for the reality of the word that energy points to and any intellectual definition won't really do it justice. Of course, there are many definitions in the realm of science which can help you understand it on the level of our intellect, but really it's something that is known and felt only through direct experience. And some people will be more familiar with energy in themselves than others. It's a learning process. Uh, most of you who listen to these videos will most likely have an idea about what it is, but I'm just saying all this because there are people who are so cut off from themselves, uh, their emotions, their body, that they actually ask the question, uh, what is energy? I have no idea. I mean, how can you not know? Uh, it's all around you and within you. And what is you? all the time. Uh, you know, for me, it's crazy to think people don't feel energy, but that's just me. And of course, it can depend on your interpretation of what you mean by energy. So why is the conservation of energy important in astral projection? Because if you don't have enough energy to get through your physical life, then how can you have enough energy to maintain conscious awareness during sleep too? You see where I'm getting at? How can you maintain conscious awareness during sleep if you can't do it while awake? Now, I'm not talking about the energy levels of the physical body, right? Because often being depleted of physical energy can actually be beneficial in order to astral project. We need that sleepiness of the physical body or else how are we going to pass through the stages of sleep and into the realms of the non-physical? But what I'm talking about here is spiritual energy, the energy of your spirit. For example, the energetic level of an advanced meditator generally has more spiritual energy to keep his marbles together, so to speak, than a typical stressed out politician who is only concerned with his day job, right? I'm just stereotyping here, of course. Uh, sorry if there's any political listeners. Um, so yes, the politician may seem to have a lot of energy to run around and get things done in the physical, and he may even stay up all night from stress. But his eyes are closed to the spiritual realm. He has no energy to maintain conscious awareness during the day, he gets angry, he doesn't remember his dreams, and anything spiritual just makes no sense to him. Whereas an advanced meditator may live a more relaxed life, perhaps may not even have as much physical energy as the politician. However, his spiritual energy allows him to be conscious and aware and maintain that with incredible strength from moment to moment. Even if he's just as busy as the politician too, he does not let his impulses decide his actions. He is conscious and aware of what's going on within himself and outside of himself. 
who remembers his dreams, and much more. Something that the politician would be very weak at doing because he has little to no spiritual energy. So just trying to make an example of two extremes there. So we have to learn how to conserve our energy. And let me tell you, we expend vast amount of spiritual energy on petty things such as arguments, stressing over bills, worrying about what our friends or colleagues think of us. Uh, We're still sad over a breakup that happened years ago. You know, just generally getting stressed out and being negative over life. Uh, c'est la vie, that's life, right? Uh, In one sense, it's extremely difficult to overcome this. And in another sense, you can drop it all here and now within a split decision, as easy as you can drop a bottle of alcohol. You simply make the decision in your heart. Easier said than done, I can hear many of you saying already, which is true, but I think we need to honour and value the fact that it is possible and not to succumb to the excessive excuses of our thoughts and our ego. So let me continue and I will explain this practice with a bit more emphasis. Uh, So this idea or principle of saving energy is inspired from many sources and teachings that I've learned and of course from my own personal experience, but also from one teaching that I want to focus on, which is from the Native American shaman Don Juan Matas. If you don't know who he is, he's in some books from a few different authors, but he was originally documented from a Western anthropologist Carlos Castaneda, who Don Juan took in as an apprentice. My Gnostic teacher also knew Don Juan and his family as he grew up in the same village as him in Sonora, Mexico. If you're interested in these books, I've linked them in the description below. I love the way Don Juan explains things in such a matter-of-factly tone. So let's take a look at some of the things Don Juan says in relation to this subject. The quotes will be on the screen if it helps you to conceptualize easier. So in one conversation, Don Juan, as he's teaching Carlos Castaneda, he says, It isn't as time goes by that you're learning shamanism. Rather, what you're learning is to save energy. And this energy will enable you to handle some of the energy fields that are not employed in perceiving the ordinary world that we know. Of course, the energy fields that he's talking about perceiving here is related to the astral world or worlds that we often visit when out of the body or in altered states of consciousness, as he talks about throughout the books. And he's also basically relating it to the fact that the ordinary world we know saps us of energy through its sort of hypnosis, that we think it's so important that we have to expend all our every last breath on it. In other words, getting lost in the external world. Of course, I'm not saying the external world hypnotizes us, I'm saying that we hypnotize ourselves and dream about the external world ourselves and form our own individual delusions of it. And so Don Juan continues, Everything we do, everything we are, rests on our personal power and energy. If we have enough of it, one word uttered to us might be sufficient to change the course of our lives. But if we don't have enough of it, the most magnificent piece of wisdom can be revealed to us and that revelation won't make a damn bit of difference. And this is quite clear in almost every spiritual community, whether in person or online, right? One can read all sorts of astral projection material or spiritual wisdom, such as a book or this channel. And depending on the person and their personal power and the level of energy, the wisdom may come to a fruition in their consciousness and come to full self-realization and profoundly affect them, or it may just completely go over their head, right? We all know this through observing ourselves and other people. And Don Juan continues, Impeccability is nothing else 
but the proper use of energy. My statements have no inkling of morality. I've saved energy and that makes me impeccable. To understand this, you have to save enough energy yourself. Don Juan often refers to people on the path to awakening as impeccable warriors. And what he means by impeccability is that we can live in a way from moment to moment in our waking life that is in alignment with the best possible way that we can live. It is to make decisions and respond to life in the most efficient way possible so as to expend the least amount of energy possible. It is to live efficiently, to not live through reactions, but through conscious and logical response. Of course, this isn't easy, right? So many things in the world make us react and overthink. But if you are really determined to live in a more spiritual way and also want to increase your chances of astral projection, then living in this way by consciously saving your energy and being impeccable can really help. Just try it for a few days and see how everything in your life goes perfectly. But you see, it's easy to be perfect. You know how to do it in your conscience, uh, but it's not so easy to maintain it. Our egos hate to live perfectly and without problems. And what's more is living perfectly, impeccably, is a great opportunity to see our egos as they arise and tempt us to cause problems in our lives and therefore this practice also helps us to know ourselves and in turn expand our consciousness. I also love the way Don Juan says, my statements have no inkling of morality, right? This isn't about being a good person in the eyes of God and being rewarded for something. No, what's also important is to realize the scientific and logical application of saving energy. And it just so happens that by living in a way where we save energy, it makes us into what society would call perfect or good citizens. When you don't live in a state of suffering and desperation, those states of consciousness which deplete us and make us leak out energy, essentially, uh, you see no logic in making choices which are going to harm yourself or others because you see that it's simply an irrational waste of energy and that by doing so, you could even start a chain of events where you'll have to deal with whatever problem you caused in the first place, requiring you to think about and deal with it all day. And so, Don Juan continues, A warrior cannot be helpless or bewildered or frightened, not under any circumstances. For a warrior, there is time only for his impeccability. Everything else drains his power. Impeccability replenishes it. And Carlos, uh, who if you read the books, you'll see he's quite clueless about most of what Don Juan says. Uh, but it's good for the reader because he really pushes Don Juan to explain what he means. And so he asks him, we're back again to my old question, Don Juan. What is impeccability? Don Juan replies, yes, we're back again to your old question. And consequently, we're back again to my old answer. Impeccability is to do your best in whatever you're engaged in. Carlos replies with, but Don Juan, my point is that I'm always under the impression I'm doing my best, and obviously I'm not. And Don Juan responds with, it's not as complicated as you make it appear. The key to all these matters of impeccability is the sense of having or not having time. As a rule of thumb, when you feel and act like an immortal being that has all the time in the world, you are not impeccable. At those times, you should turn, look around, and then you will realize that your feeling of having time on this earth is an idiocy. There are no survivors on this earth. What Don Juan means by that is 
and how he often describes through the books is people are often lost in their folly, right? In their dramas and dreams and willy-nilly, half-baked, uh, fickle efforts in whatever endeavors, right? Even spiritual endeavors. We're always going in a direction without any sense of conscience or inner guidance. Why? Because we take life for granted. And as Don Juan implies, it's not that complicated when you deeply realize that your time here on earth is limited. Death is always at the door, and death is a gateway that we all have to face eventually. As he says, there are no survivors on this earth, hence why the path is often referred to him as sort of spiritual warriors. Because, you know, there is a sort of inner battle, especially at the beginning of the path. And if you know enough about astral projection, you'll also understand how it profoundly helps us not only to come to terms with death, but also how it benefits our consciousness after death. I can of course make a video in the future more specifically about the afterlife and such things. So to give a sort of concluding statement from Don Juan, he says, From where the average man stands, journeying into other worlds is nonsense or an ominous mystery beyond his reach. And he's right, not because this is an absolute fact, but because the average man lacks the energy to deal with shamanism. The average man can't perceive the world shamans do because all his energy is already deployed. So in other words, our energy is completely deployed into the material world along with its attachments, stress, and dramas of life. Now, do not interpret this as, okay, okay, I'm too invested in the material, I'm going to renounce all my possessions, my job, my relationships, and live in a shack and eat the bare minimum. <laughs> uh, no, the point is you don't necessarily need to change anything. Just let go of your attachment to it all. And through detachment, you create more space within yourself as you go about your business in the physical world. And actually, you'll find that if you don't get caught up in the external world's webs and traps of temptations, illusions, and confusions, and emotional roller coasters, uh, you'll, you'll actually be able to operate more efficiently in it too. This is sort of related to stoicism as well, right? The endurance of pain without attached feelings or complaints, right? And I know this might seem hard if you like this subject that I'm talking about, but you think it's too difficult to execute, uh, you know, saving energy, not succumbing to our emotions, transcending the ego. And I know a lot of people say it's difficult, it's too difficult, you know, life is really hard and it is. Uh, let me tell you, in the past year, I worked up to 50, 60 hours a week, you know, uh, I work full time in my day job, uh, do this YouTube, wrote a book, I moved countries, uh, essentially became homeless for like six months and lived in a two bedroom house amongst five other people with barely any privacy for meditation and spiritual things. And amongst all that commotion of material circumstance, I still had energy to have profound astral experiences. One of them, for example, being the experience that I shared in the last video, which I'll put on the screen now. So kind of just to say harshly, there's no excuse to say I'm just too busy. No, if you're going to say that, please at least realize that no, you're not too busy in the external world. You're too busy in your internal world. And I'm telling you that that feeling of being too busy is frankly not necessary. If you're too busy for anything meaningful in your life, then what's the point in living? The ego is always obsessed with wanting to feel compulsively in control with life. But if you live in a state of allowance and harmony and surrender, you will see that life happens anyway. It happens for you anyway. And 
you can get a lot of things done with very little stress or just none at all. So be decisive. If you want to walk the path, walk it. If you don't want to, don't. But don't complain about it and say you have excuses because there really is none. You can do it no matter your physical circumstance. You can be in prison and still do it. Many, many masters and spiritual teachers have had extremely difficult lives if you look into them. And they have all come to profound realizations and experiences internally. It doesn't matter about your external circumstance. And sure, of course, you have to spend some energy to create things in your life, right? But I'm saying we don't have to spend as much of it as we think. For example, just a few ways you can start saving energy is by removing stress, complaining, and negativity from your life. Now, it's one thing to remove these depleting states of consciousness from your life, right? But it's another thing to maintain it. You see, if you have a particular habit of getting into a depressed sort of mood, or you get angry in a particular situation, or certain situations just make you emotionally react, well, when you eventually do manage to successfully stop getting into those states of consciousness, you'll still eventually sometimes feel a pull to go back to your old ways. Why? Because psychologically, it's like we have multiple egos running around our heads, right? And they get energy from us when we act out their desires and thoughts. But when you stop submitting to them, they get hungry. And you may even feel them more intensely. You have to persist. And essentially, you'll starve them to death. Uh, you need to have patience and persistence and understanding with yourself. Change absolutely comes with mindful and persistent and patient practice and a firm resolve to overcome certain aspects of yourself. It's not something that you can just do with a fickle mindset. You have to be sure about what you want, that a certain part of yourself is making your life more miserable. And so you want to stop acting in those ways. You know, like a lot of new age teachings say, uh, raise your vibration. Well, we don't do that just by imagining or feeling emotions of peace and love and all those rainbows and butterflies, right? The real work is deep down in our foundation and we need to dig out our old crap, uh, you know, clean out our room, so to speak. And this is really the most profound way to raise your vibration because your vibration is, you know, as a human being is already pure and, you know, you are an expression of the cosmos, but it's just that we have these blockages within us that we create. A high vibration is our natural state. And, you know, once you do start transcending a few aspects of yourself, there's a sort of momentum that you can cultivate, which makes it easier over time. And eventually you'll stop leaking so much spiritual energy. Of course, in this video, I've been talking about the principle of conserving energy and I'm relating it strongly to the transcendence of the ego. So of course, in the future, I will make more specific videos on how to overcome the ego. And also a lot of this is also rooted in self-awareness. And if you can work just on self-awareness alone, then this naturally leads to self-control. Why? Because you can't control something that you're not aware of. So this takes profound self-inquiry, self-reflection, and meditation. And be patient, of course, it can take time. And just think, next time you want to sulk about not being able to astral project, even getting upset or frustrated about it is just an energetically inefficient way to deal with it. You know, crying and kicking yourself thinking that your efforts aren't going anywhere is literally just a waste of time and energy. And consider that instead of doing that, then perhaps an experience would have come your way the following night. You know, when you make these efforts, your spiritual energy saves up. Have faith that your saving focus and energy and a momentum is building up. 
in many levels of your being, including your subconscious. The ego is always going to plant doubts in your mind. You don't need to pay attention to it. And when the ego sees that you're steadfast, that you're firm, that you want to do this, he'll stop. Those voices will stop. You will start integrating your consciousness to be more whole and present with a firmer resolve. Personal challenges will always arise and your patience may sometimes be tested. When that sort of restlessness or upset emotions come knocking at the door, are you going to invite them in to make a mess of your recently nice, tidy, clean house that you've been working on? Or are you going to say, no thank you and peacefully shut the door? If you're an impatient person, then your impatience will test you. If you're a fearful person, then your fear will test you. If you're a lustful person, then your lust will test you. Why does this happen? Because the doors to astral projection, our inner astral doorway, is blocked. None other than ourselves, our mechanical, unconscious selves, our ego, or egos, should I say. And so it's normal that we have to face ourselves first, and then accordingly move them out of the way. How do we do that? Well, we don't do it by wishing for some ego death through a drug, and we don't do it by praying to a higher power, although that might help a little bit. We do it by profoundly and intelligently comprehending our psychological aspects through self-observation and living life in the present moment. Present moment in the sense of intensely inhabiting your body and understanding the subtle psychological and biological and energetic reactions that occur within your life as you go about your day. When you get in touch with the energy of your body, the path starts to become so much clearer. This is not something you can talk about, it has to be deeply felt. For example, if you're constantly thinking lustful thoughts throughout your day, then you have to understand why. Feel your body. Know what triggers you. Meditate on it. How can you gain control over it? How can you exercise self-awareness? Meditation is not just about sitting peacefully in bliss. It's a tool to understand oneself. If you're always wanting to eat more throughout the day and at night, always wanting, wanting to fill something in your life and even dreaming of food compulsively, then, you know, find out why. If you're always angry and it just completely stops any form of serenity or clear thinking or meditation, then ask yourself why you're doing that and start taking action to grow and learn and find out how you can begin to rein in those impulses. Seek to understand yourself, or better yet, temet noske, which is Latin for know thyself. This work on comprehending and transcending our subconscious parts of ourselves is how we dig deeper into our own subconscious and through it we begin to learn how to program ourselves within the subconscious in a more efficient way and thus we instinctively start to learn how to do it to plant seeds of intention for astral projection too because we start to live in a deeper level of consciousness because as you know if you've watched my videos or read my book Astral projection is entirely possible through intention alone. And, and this whole video is just one of the ways we can gain a deeper instinctive understanding of how to deploy intention. And, you know, another way to conclude this principle is to stop giving your energy to dreams, right? And save it for journeys out of the body. And remember... It's also important not to judge yourself. Only observe. Don't be attached to your imperfections or self-indulge in them. That's just creating more problems and self 
entanglement. Just be detached, logical, and systematic with yourself. Be like a scientist. You note down all the things of yourself, then you systematically, through self-awareness and meditation, just gradually start to grow and learn. You know, growing and learning and awareness and acceptance of yourself is usually enough and change comes with time. But if you're not even looking at yourself and you're not even looking in the mirror, you don't have self-awareness and not looking at yourself from different perspectives and your behavior throughout your waking life, then change barely comes. And that is the state of most people. We all have things we can work on to improve ourselves and as long as you're making efforts towards a less unconscious life, then that's all that matters. So be gentle and kind with yourself too. Uh, It's important to note as well when I talk about not being angry, lustful, impatient, frustrated, I'm not saying it's wrong or bad or sinful. No, I'm saying that these types of impulsive ways of being are not ideal for astral projection. It blocks our spiritual vision and expends too much energy. You don't need to think about this or debate it. You can feel it if you're attentive enough during those moments. For example, we've all been angry, right? If you have a bout of anger, feel how long it takes for you to feel serene and at peace again. The energy of anger is quite strong and you can feel that dense energy. And afterwards, there is a period of spiritual recovery that happens afterwards in anyone. And if you had a really bad bout of anger and you resist any sort of recovery in your conscious mind because, you know, you're just so pissed off at a situation, then that recovery will have to take place in your sleep when your conscious mind finally gives up. Or in other words, your ego finally gives up. And during sleep, your consciousness will be too busy sorting itself out and helping you to spiritually recover as best as it can. And this is what you experience as dreams or nightmares at night related to the dramas of the day, related to your anger, most likely, especially if your anger is so strong that your subconscious is still holding on to that emotion, depending on the situation. Dreams are a way for our consciousness to process traumas, confusions, and unsettled emotions which we had during the day. And thus, at night, it's highly unlikely you'll gain any sort of profound conscious experiences out of the body because you're simply too invested in your dreams of the external world. So... Yes, uh, this video went on longer than I thought. Uh, I hope this was insightful for some of you. It's a tricky topic to cover. Uh, The fact that we spend so much energy on useless things, uh, but also the fact that we're doing this to ourselves, which not so many people are willing to admit. And I know there's a lot of sort of spiritual controversy around the ego and there's many ideas around that. So, um, of course, as always, if you need any clarification on anything I've mentioned, or maybe you might think you've misinterpreted something, uh, just ask me whatever you need to in the comments below and I will get back to you. Thank you for listening. Please share it with anyone who is perhaps upset or afraid that they can't yet astral project. Maybe this will help. Um, Books and teachings amongst astral projection barely ever talk about the aspect of the ego, and I think it's one of the most important aspects. And I know this additional question is also going to be asked about whether sexual energy has a role in all this, since it is an energy Uh, quite a strong energy in fact and I will make a video on that about a deeper look into sexual energy and specifically sexual transmutation but it is an even more sensitive and trickier subject Uh, so yes if you want to hear more information on that please make sure you're subscribed to the channel and I also have some information about that in my book too. So thank you again for listening 
I will leave some information and links in the description below and I will see you on the next video.